so this is the final part of um, all the lectures, and there will be two ha two more hands-on, and we're finished. So uh, mo moving on from this HP FMM, uh, just a brief description of, oh, before I go to this, maybe I should um, review, like, so since I've talked a lot about FMM, I just thought it would be nice to show like the history of FMM over the years. So the, these are all work that are related to you know, the fast multiple method. And um, the different colors represent like the papers from different areas of, of science, like uh, uh, astrophysicists, molecular dynamicists, and you know, computer scientists, applied mathematicians have all contributed to um, the advancement, and so the applied mathematicians, you know, developed all the underlying math. Like um, the focus initially was on, uh, you know, the extension to like from 2D to 3D, and then to more uh, complicated equations. All that have Green's functions, though. So um, all of these equations, um, although the ones that came later are more challenging to solve. Um, are all functions, uh, you know, the, the, the PDEs that have Green's functions. And so we can all now solve all of these equations uh, using fast multiple method. Um, but also, um, there's also a more generalized approach to FMM, where if, even if you don't have these equations, um, you can do like a kernel independent FMM or block box FMM. These can handle, or SVD based FMM. These can handle um, other types of calculate, uh, equations which are not these equations like Laplace, Helmholtz, and Stokes. So you can do things like um, you know, exponential functions or matern functions, uh, you know, like more um, complicated uh, radial type functions that people use in. Uh, statistics and also from about the year around here like 2010 um, a lot of papers on uh, you know the HSS or H matrix these these papers started to come out and now uh, we have so many that I haven't uh, written um, in this table here like from 2014 onwards there's so many that I can't even fit into this page so um, the, and also another branch of, of you know, like computer scientists were looking at fast multiple methods from like a completely different perspective. So like how to parallelize, not not like necessarily you know extend its capability to to you know like more general problems or anything, but you know things like uh, how how to load balance, how to partition, um, you know different ways of partitioning, uh, use on GPUs or like other you know, um, tools, using tools like Charm++. Plus Plus. And um, in, in like the field of optimizing the code, you also have these ways of not necessarily extending the capability of the code, but just making it faster by using different types of expansions um, or different ways of uh, determining the well-separatedness. And uh, you know, like the, the variable p approach, and, and things like this. So um, there have been different uh, contributions, and you know, not all of these features are inside one code. So you you have all of these studies, um, but you know, we, we don't have like a one big community code, you know, like Petsy that has all these features, for example. So, so may, maybe, you know, in the future we might have something like this, but at the moment we don't. So um, th this is a, like the brief history of what has been done in fast multiple uh, methods. There, there's, of course, much more than this. There's like, you know, 500 papers that I could cite that made like significant contributions to um, the field of fast multiple methods, but I'm just citing here like a, you know, very brief, um, uh, like a very fine selection of that. And then, um, so I, I mentioned that there are so many studies on the matrix variants now. Um, so I, I've just summarized 
Like this is, you think of this as like a, um, a news update for these H matrix, HSS, and FMM uh, related publications in 2015. So um, this is like, a, you know, think of this as a news feed. And it's just highlighting some pictures uh, of some of the work that has been done very, very recently. So I'm just trying to show you, you know, a little bit of the new stuff because everything that I've mentioned up to now is considered old stuff. I'm just, you know, doing it because it's a lecture and I, you know, started to start from the basics. But now this is the considered, you know, the cutting edge of this research. So now I'm taking you fast forwarding to the, the bleeding edge of the uh, research that's done in this field. So this is um, like, and I think you can understand the essence of all this work because of the information that I gave you throughout this lecture. So now you're ready to sort of understand, um, you know, the, the essence of what the contribution of these works are. So that's why I'm showing them to you here. So um, th this one is one of the techniques that sort of have, um, you know, uh, um, the, I remember that I mentioned the weak admissibility, the ones that don't divide the box so much, um, have a problem when you go to higher dimensions. So this is a technique that tries to uh, solve that problem, but still use, continue to use the weak admissibility. But it, it does it in like a sort of a dimension reduction um, uh, fashion that if, even if you're dealing with a 3D problem, um, you know, it sort of reduces that to a 2D and then a 1D. And it's sort of, um, it, there is an analogy of, of this work and um, the, the work on, you know, like the, the hierarchical sure complement that, that you're doing. So there, there's like, if you draw a picture of this, it's like, you know, you have a volume and then a, a face and then edge and then, you know, the, you're separating the separator kind of picture is um, done in this kind of dimension reduction. They call this a dimension reduction. Uh, a pro a skeletonization, yeah. So, and so uh, th this work here is um, yet another way to keep the weak admissibility. But then, so I, I told you, if you do this for high dimensions, these off-diagonal blocks don't compress very well. Uh, well, so this block here becomes very large if it doesn't compress. But then, what this does here is it, it's ah uh, no sorry this this one isn't that one. This one, is, uh, this one is just using the HSS for uh, inside a multifrontal method. So um, the method I was about to tell you, actually, um, which one is it? It, it compresses the, the dense block here further by nesting the HSS. It's called HSS2D. Uh, but it's the same person that works on it. Uh, so uh, th this is that kind of technique. Also, there have been combinations with, you know, this is more like an implementation issue, but this has been done on MPI. Um, and in terms, this, this one has been done on Xeon Phi, for example, the Intel um, coprocessor that's like a, you know, it looks like a GPU um, from Intel. Um, so it, this kind of work has been done on these new architectures. And um, I, I, I mentioned that the H matrix or HSS matrix consumes a lot of memory because it stores many things. But this one tries to tackle that issue by you know, not, not creating uh, all the dense things at once, but um, trying to do it line by line. And also you have on the FMM side, um, FMM for, so FMM calculates uh, like a point uh, operation between points. It doesn't do the continuum integration. Uh, but this one is for handling um, actual volume integrals. That means not discrete summation, the sigma, but actual the um, you know, integral operation throughout the volume by using uh, like a quadrature points to represent. Well, they turn into points eventually, but um, it has its own sort of uh, discretization scheme built in so it can handle continuum integrals and not the discrete point summations. And uh, th th these approaches, this one is sort of a um, uh, hierarchical approach that, does, that sort of does it bottom up. So usually um, you, you look at the problem from the top and then you think about 
how, how to uh, subdivide the region uh, further. But this one is, um, so it has advantages when you have uh, jumping coefficients. So say that you're solving uh, um, uh, Poisson equation, variable po coefficient Poisson equation, um, you know, like for a reservoir or something, and then you have these jumps in the coefficients. So you can actually draw the line, um, you know, of the separator that matches with that um, jump in the coefficient. And if you're doing it bottom up, you can, you know, always align. If you're doing it top down, it's sort of difficult to align that with the, well, maybe you can do it, but um, it's more natural to do it bottom up. So um, this is that kind of technique for variable coefficients. And um, butterfly fact factorization is yet another um, idea uh, for doing, so this is the hierarchy, think of this as the target tree and this as the source tree. Um, what it does is it flips the source tree and it does the operations against all levels. But so the highest level of the target tree is interacting with the lowest level of the, so this arrow here, uh, lowest level of the, the source tree. And it does this kind of operation for all the levels. And then it looks like um, the butterfly communication in FFT. So people who have studied FFT know that there's this thing that has X's, you know, that go from top to bottom and then half the distance and then, you know, half of that. And it looks like a butterfly. So it's called the butterfly communication in FFT. But this one looks like a butterfly factorization. So it factorizes according, it has a log n, you know, you do it log n times because there's log n um, uh, levels in a tree. And so it's an n log n method to solve um, in, in this kind of form. And also uh, inverse FMM is something I briefly mentioned earlier. So FMM can do the matrix vector multiplication, but um, you, you can actually uh, do the inverse operation now. And since you can use it as a direct solver in that case, it, if you do it with lower accuracy, it becomes a good preconditioner. So this, this work introduces the inverse FMM and use it as a preconditioner. And they have nice pictures that, you know, they sort of explain how you reduce the fill-in when you do this inversion operation. So, so this is a, you know, like brief news update of recent work. So now you know what's, uh, you know, the state of the art in this field. So, yep. Yeah. Okay. So that, that uh, sort of grouping of the uh, tree, yeah. uh, is that the multifunctional in the emission tree and they grab, group uh, some labels together? together yeah, so uh, I think that the idea is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the same as these, well, so this is solving LDL and not LU or, or Cholesky, but um, yeah. so th this one I think is doing like a standard LU or something and then um, for the sure complement, it's compressing with HSS. So it's the same idea. You do, mul yeah, multifrontal, and then the, the dense sure complement that it forms, you apply the HSS, and this is just simply doing that on Z on phi. So, I mean, if you, if you don't look at that, it's just the compression being applied to the sure complement. So it's, you know. Oh, yes, so, so, so the highest level has the deepest tree, right? But you can see that the lower, um, the smaller sure complements, you just make a shallow tree and, not, you know, it, it doesn't create a very deep tree uh, of hierarchy. But it, uh, the off-diagonal blocks you can think of, you know, if you um, can imagine, uh, you know, the, these pictures here. The off-diagonal blocks of this biggest sure complement are, you know, like uh, this, and then it's refined to like a, you know, deeper level for the big sure complement. And at some point, it doesn't make any sense to do it hierarchically anymore, so you just do the dense, dense linear algebra directly. So I don't know at which level they switch, but the key here, I think, is to use the Z on phi efficiently, you want to do switch to the dense operations earlier, because uh, Z on phi can handle the dense linear algebra, you know, the DGEM quite fast, but, um, well, maybe it's not DGEM, it's, it's, it's the dense, um, a, a, a inversion um, or no the the solve operation, and you you want to calculate um, you want to switch to the completely dense and not hierarchical version early if you're using GPUs or Xeon phi's. So so there's sort of a 
nested hierarchy here because you have the hierarchy of the sure complement. Well, you have the you know sparse hierarchical structure, and then inside the dense blocks, you have another um, sort of compressed hierarchical structure for the H mat uh, HSS matrix. Yes, and yeah. So um, the, when you read this paper, you just need to know where it switched to the dense because I think that's the interesting point in the you know, going to the Xeon phi's. So, so this is a great, great good, uh, say, compress, compression in the, for example, root, yeah, a root label, are you saying HSS? Is that yeah, I, I think you get fairly good. So I, um, you know, like the, the, the paper I sent you on the low rank properties of the sure complements, that probably yeah. explains something about, yeah, how, how much this can be um, compressed. Okay, so yeah, I just not so critical, but um, this is a um, some some something about my code that I'm developing. So what I want to do is um, I want to have separate modules for my FMM code. So I've developed many FMM codes, and every time I have to develop all these things. But I end up just, you know, co copying from the old kernels this part, and usually I rewrite the tree structure. But you know, like the MPI part, um, I, I'm developing separately and have other people working on it. So it, it's nice to have like a modular view of these um, different components. And so what a FMM code should look like in the future is, I think, it should have like these P2M, M2M, M2L. These parts should be developed like uh, for by by um, well first the equations should be developed by applied mathematicians and uh, highly optimized versions of the code can be developed by the the coding ninjas and um, the tree part is of interest to a lot of computer scientists but they have no clue what's happening inside the kernels and they they're not interested in that in general but um, every time they they try to do some experiments, they you know, uh, depend on having these other components. So it's good to have like a modular uh, view and you know, may maybe even have like different codes that just d do this and do this and then do this part and then just um, you know, download each of them and um, run them together. And that way, um, because each of these parts have people from different areas um, uh, interested in, in working on them. So uh, it would be nice to have the different parts being um, worked on by different people. Okay, uh, this is my final slide. Uh, I just wanted to briefly mention about what happens to the matrix version when you do it in parallel, or in distributed memory. So I explained to you many things about um, you know, f how to partition and you know, the concept of the local essential tree for the fast multiple method. Um, and what, what, about, what happens when you want to do it for the matrix version? Uh, so first of all, the big difference is um, you, 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 in the fast multiple method, you don't actually store this matrix at all. So um, it, it's not a problem to have, you know, like just, you, you, all you have are the two trees on both sides in the fast multiple method. So the analogy um, would be FMM has this tree here and this tree here, but the H matrix stores um, sort of the tensor product between these two trees. So it has like, you know, this tree uh, being multiplied in a dimension. Uh, in the other dimension, you have this tree. So um, w the way we partition the FMM uh, is such that each of the ranks, MPI ranks, have a subtree uh, owned as a target. And then you collect the parts of the global tree um, from the source tree that this target tree needs. And that was called the local essential tree. So what does that look like in the matrix form? Um, that looks like this. So each of the targets are the, the, the rows. And, and all the... Um, source tree, the source tree spans the columns. And so the local essential tree is actually this block here, right? It, there's a direct correspondence. So this 
tree being white here and only having this big blue block is sort of similar to having only this big blue block here. You don't need these diagonal dense components from this, air, this column. You need just the big components from this, this, this column here. And so you just get this block here. And same, same for here. You just get the, the, um, you know, the not so dense parts of the source tree. And then for, your, for yourself, my rank, you have the fully dense thing. So the parts that need to be communicated are um, this part, this part, and this part you already have. So also this part. So the local essential tree is like you know, this, this whole um, row. Uh, of your H matrix. Now, in, when, you, when you do these operations, if you're just doing a matrix vector multiplication, even for the matrix form, you don't need to communicate any of the matrix because um, basically what you need to do is send all the basis functions that construct, um, you know, the, the basically what the local essential tree is sending, the same information equivalent to the multiple. You just need to send those uh, V bases uh, and then um, you construct what is necessary, the matrix entries, locally. So this part you only construct locally. And then all the operations that need to be done to obtain these, um, the matrix entries can be constructed locally from, from what you have sent for the bases. And so there's no need to communicate any matrix elements if you're just doing a matrix vector multiplication. So, so um, Basically, you can refactor the hierarchical matrix so that you don't have to send um, any of the matrix elements. Then um, the problem is, so say that you wanted to do matrix inversion, then, then you, you do need to start sending um, all the matrix entries. And this is more so if you um, factorized in the beginning. And then, um, so the factorize, factorization part requires you know, the sending uh, of the matrices. Once you factorize, then if you just store this part locally, then the apply phase you can just keep applying without communication. But um, the, the factorization part is, is the part that sort of requires other information about the matrix elements from the others. So um, th there is um, another uh, way to uh, invert a matrix that doesn't require you to you know, send all the information. It's just um, you can do, so if you iterate to obtain um, the matrix at k plus 1 uh, through the Newton-Schultz iteration, then you can turn a matrix inversion into a matrix-matrix uh, multiplication. And so this was suggested. Um, by different people at different times. Um, and and uh, so basically what you need um, if you want to do a matrix matrix, so this was for a matrix vector. Uh, if you want to do a matrix matrix multiplication of a hierarchical matrix, then uh, so the, the target would be this whole thing here because it's a matrix matrix. So for a matrix vector, all you need is the vector here. So you, the, the part you need is this, the local essential tree. But for a matrix matrix, the target is this light, blue, light green part. And then the source is actually, maybe it's difficult to see, but there's a dark part that's not entirely black in this figure. That, those are all the parts that you need to send. And so um, it, it turns out that you actually still need to send, um, you know, a, a large portion of the remaining matrix if you want to do the matrix matrix. And so th there's no, um, but it, it's more parallel in the sense that it, it, um, it has a shorter critical path during the um, matrix, matrix multiplication than, than having to invert it because there's a dependency when you need to do the inversion. Uh, matrix, matrix, you can just do in parallel. So, um, but still, um, when, you, when you try to do more complicated operations using the matrix form, then uh, it's not very scalable. And this is mentioned by many people. So we still haven't um, found a very scalable solution for 
uh, more complicated operations for these hierarchical matrices. And you know, the, the matrix vector we can do very efficiently. And the FMM does that very efficiently too. But I don't know how, for example, the inverse fast multiple method scales. There haven't been any studies on that. Because every time you want to do something that's not a matrix vector, the communication becomes quite complicated for these methods. So, so this is sort of a, a remaining question, an open question. And um, so this is sort of the end of the lecture. It ends with like a, you know, some questions that haven't been answered. But anyway, I, I just wanted to explain um, what happens to these matrix forms uh, when you want to run them on a large, large machine. So this is, this is like the end of uh, my slides. So now, uh, w without taking a break, I'm just going to move to the coding session. So let's switch to, switch to the code and see what happens with the, the kernels. Or should I? Should Okay, now we, well, may, maybe I'll review what we did, uh, where we left off last time. So just to review, um, we, we finished the adaptive tree, step eight, and this is all online. So if you go online and download all the new code, um, the latest one is step eight. And then yesterday we did all the parallel stuff, but we didn't touch step eight. So um, for those of you uh, that did the exercise of parallelizing, um, you know, steps 5, 6, and 7, and 8, you, you might have a parallel step 8. But let's look at the not parallel step 8. And so what we had here was the, the sort of full FMM that skips the empty boxes. And so the difference between step 7 and step 8 was that we introduced the, these maps be, that map between uh, the full Morton index and you know the the skipped index, and so cells maps from the skipped index to the full index, and cells two maps the full index to the skipped index. So you can go back and forth by um, using these two um, arrays. Uh, you can turn one index into the other. So you can go back and forth between the full and skipped and the non-empty um, index. So now, uh, the last thing I think we did was to change the level offset so that it, it uses the non-empty one, the, not the full uh, Morton index. And so the, the memory consumption should be like optimal right now. It, it only stores the boxes that are not empty. And so, uh, and we, com we checked that this was working. Let, let me check again just to make sure that it's still working. Uh, so if I do step eight and run it, the two numbers should match. So it's showing, if you remember, it was like 209 something something. And you know, it's matching on both sides. What one is from the direct summation and the other one is from the approximation. And so the last thing, so what we want to do today is to change this code so that each of these kernels, P2M, M2M, M2L, these things, this part here, turns into the high order calculation that comes from the Taylor expansion. So to do that um, first, I want to make this part into like a function call so that it calls a function called m2p and then it returns this thing here. Because once it becomes a function call, I can just change the function 
inside of the function, and then it will automatically you know, change here. without I don't have to touch the rest of the code. So I want to wrap this operation here, although it's just one line. I want to put this thing inside a function. And the same for all the other ones. I want to put them, put all of these things I inside of a function so that um, I can calculate the other kernels. But before, before we do that, um, we, we need to know, for example, right now we're only calculating the first term. So we don't need, for example, the coordinates of the box and the bodies to calculate the multiple expansions. But when, once we go to high order, we need the information of the coordinates of the center of the boxes and the, um, the bodies to do the P2M and L2P. So, um, first, maybe we will uh, try to calculate, um, you know, put, put these into a function call. But then the next thing we need to do is to actually make sure we're able to calculate the um, coordinates of these things. So those, once those two things are done, um, I, ha I have the kernels ready in a different file. So I'll just import those high order kernels and then <coughs> we should be good to go. So yeah, also this P2P and um, check answer part, um, we, can, we can change into like a, a function call so that it just takes in some number. Um, and then we can just change the equation however we want it to. So OK, now let's do that one by one, starting from uh, P2M. So what we want to do is to change this into some function that calculates, you know, this this M term here, and we need to have a AND here for it to return the value. Otherwise, it can't return uh, the value. So, and then we have QJ here. But in the future, we want to have the coordinates of the boxes also being passed. But for now, we will just pass this P to M. Um, you know. So the input is Q, and the output is M. It doesn't make any sense right now, because it's just one line anyway. But when we make this complicated, I think it will make more sense to have this as a function. OK, so now we define the function to be this, this line here. So if you go maybe outside of the main function, yeah, here, and define something called P2M that takes in um, this. So since we're inputting already um, with the index, we just need to I think we just need to write like this, because it's our, the index is already being specified when, before we pass it. So it, we're just passing one number, not the array. So we don't need to have the index here. And this is useful because when we, when we introduce the more complicated kernels, we don't have to have all that index uh, complication here. We can just put the equation in a very simple form. Um, and it would be more intuitive what we are calculating here. Okay, so let's let's check. Oh, I should have saved. Um, I should have saved eight to step nine because I want to preserve step eight. Okay. So because I have this version controlled. I, I can actually change back to the original state. So see, step eight is now yeah, back to its original form. OK. May, well, for those of you who didn't have it saved, you can just download the old one again. OK, step nine, I'm going to do like a, um, call it kernel function, because we're defining all the things that were in mind now as a function. OK, 
P to M looks like this. M plus equals Q. Very simple. It's actually closer to the actual equation that I showed on the slide, but this is only U. I need to have the star here. Yeah, still working. Okay, so because because I'm passing in this as a pointer, I need to I need to dereference it here, like uh, m. Okay. If this was C plus plus, I can just put and here and use just m. But uh, because this is C, I need to write it like this. Okay, so um, we will change this gradually, but for now, this this looks okay. So now we did P to M. Okay. Now, the next thing is the M to M kernel. So we'll do the same thing, right? It's so we just take in this whole thing as the output argument, and then we take this whole thing as the input. And remember, the input, it doesn't need to have the AND mark because we don't have to write to it. So it doesn't need to be a pointer. OK, now we move this whole thing to the function definition that's next to P to M. We will do like a M to M. And well, actually, we don't. So we need to make sure that this is named. They're both M, so we can't just name them both M. Maybe I'll call this MI and this one MJ. Okay. So star MI plus equals MJ, like this. Okay, this is the new M to M. And we've it's just one line of code for now because the uh, the kernel is very simple right now. But let's see. Oh, sorry. I'll keep this window open, and then, like I've been doing before, I will operate on this side so that you can, you can see. You can still see the code while I'm compiling on this side. OK, still matching. So we're, we're, we're doing good here. OK. Now I move to M2L. So the, the good thing about rewriting like this is that all the complex code is done outside. And you're do only doing the mathematical operations inside. And so, so it's very easy to, to change the, the kernels to a more complex form. OK, now I'm going to copy this thing here. Oh. This thing here to, and and this needs to be, have an and again, this, this I just I'm just copying what was written down here and adding it as an input parameter to the function m2l. So what I'm doing is very straightforward and putting it here. Uh, you may not be able to see the whole screen, but I'm just copying over what was l and m and putting it inside m2l. OK, now I go up and calculate void m2l and now double. Again, I can, I can just say this is mi and this is mj. But this time, I'm not doing plus equals. I need, oh sorry, this should be l and m. And this time, I am adding m divided by, oh, so I should pass r, right? R, r needs to be passed. 
double R. So, so this is an example where it's actually calculating the distance r. We need to do this for the other kernels too. Well, not necessarily r, but we need to calculate this distance dx and dy eventually for the other kernels because the higher order terms for P2M, M2M, L2L, and L2P also use this dx and dy. So, um, Yeah, perhaps a better way uh, would be to input into the function um, something that determines dx and dy inside the kernel. But oh, it's okay. For now, we'll just we'll just input r here. Make the changes gradually. I don't want to break the code. So. Yeah, still okay. So then L to L, one change at a time. So for L to L, I will add this part here. And put an and, and mark. And then this part here. I add here and I define L to L up here double okay I'm now going to use L I and L J because they're both L So li equals, or plus equals, okay, this, this should give me the correct answer, step 9.c, yes, okay, so now we finished up to L to L, I'm doing the same thing for all of them, just taking this one line that I'm calculating and changing it to a function call with the appropriate kernel name. And for this case, it would be, output would be uj, and the input should be this l thing here. So I'll just copy this thing to the box here. And this is also a plus equal operation, so I'm going to define up before the main void L2P uh, double star uh, U and double L and U star star U should be L. Okay, let's see if this is giving still the correct answer. Yes. Okay, now, now we are almost done. I think I'm also going to change the P2P. Okay, so for this case also we need to input R and so P2P I'm writing to you I and inputting QJ and R like this. And then I can just copy over this one line to function definition void P2P on double U Q R and And so this r not equals to zero still works because I'm passing r 
as our argument. And I don't need the index for u and q. So this, this becomes star u plus equals q divided by r. Let's see if this one still works. Yes. And now the good thing is I can I can use the exact same thing for the that check answer. And when I change the contents of P2P, um, you know, at some point, if I want to, um, I'm assuring that both parts will be changed in the same way because I'm turning it into a function. So it's good. So all I need to do is change this check answer part to like this, and then, okay, so now it's running, like um, giving the same answer. So step nine, I think we're okay, just um, we will leave this as step nine, and I will upload this code now that it's uh, finished. Step 9, I upload to, okay, Google. Yes. Okay, I think it's uploaded now. So if you didn't follow, uh, you can just download step 9. I just changed each of the operations to a function that has the name of the kernel. So I define P2M, M2M, M2L, L2L, L2P, and P2P as a function. And now I will copy this to step 10. And step 9 to step 10, and then what I will do is I will import, or no, first I need to um, pass the coordinates for each of the kernels. So before, I didn't need, for example, the x and y calculation for p to m, because it was just summing q. But if you look back at what we need, so I'm going to open the the equation slide just to show you why I needed to change uh, where is the uh, yes here or maybe this one is better okay so uh, we we want to change p to m into this thing here and m to m into this thing here m to l to this thing l to l l to p and um, what we need here is, before we didn't have x vector, but now we need the x j prime j vector, which is the distance vector between uh, the center of the box and each particle. And also here, we need to have the distance vector. And here, also, we need to have the distance vector. So at each location, we need to have the dx and dy, which is the distance between um, the two points that we're calculating. So I will now change the function so that they take in as input the dx and dy. So that, that should be enough for me to calculate all these kernels. Okay, So it's just one change. I'm going to change so that p2m, m2m, m2l, l2l, and l2p they don't calculate the high order terms yet. I'm just going to change the input so that they can take in um, as an argument the dx and dy because that's a necessary step um, before we go move on. Okay, so how do I calculate the center of each, each cell? So I need to I need to first calculate the center uh, of each cell. So. I can do this from the Morton index, right? Because so it, it's already doing it here. This is this is the answer because here I'm doing it. 
Uh, I'm, I'm using um, get ix to get the two-dimensional index. So remember, this, this cells thing will map my non-empty index to the full Morton index. So this cells at level L, I see, is going to return to me the full um, Morton index. And then if I input this to get ix, it's going to give me like a, either, you know, like a two numbers, one and three, which represent where my box is. From, from those numbers, if I, um, if I have the, let's see, so that number divided by an x is uh, not, not actually, so I, okay, so there's a little bit more math involved than that because think, think of what these coordinates are. So this is a good example. Look at this picture. So we define all the points by DRAND48 to be between 0 and 1. So this whole domain, we know that it starts from 0 and goes to 1. And we know that all these boxes are here. So it's very easy to calculate the center of each box. What we do is we know that this is 0 and this is 1. So if this is divided into 4, then first what we need to do is to divide um, the, the zero from 0 to 1 by 4. So this is 1 fourth. This is also 1 fourth. This, the size is also 1 fourth and 1 fourth. And then the center is at like halfway between those numbers. So if this whole box was 1 fourth, then this point is at 1 eighth and 1 eighth. This one is at 3 eighths. This one is at 5 eighths. And this one is at 7 eighths. So we will use that kind of math to calculate. So I think the simplest way to express that would be to do you know, first um, uh, calculate how many boxes it's divided into in each direction. That, that we are using a variable nx to define that. So we first um, divide uh, the number that we get by nx. And the number that we get here should be, um, so if we get 0, 1, 2, 3, we need a way to translate 0, 1, 2, 3 to 1 eighth, 3 eighths, 5 eighths, and 7 eighths. So it, it's like multiplying, well, first we need to subtract, uh, what, like 0 0.5, or add 0 0.5 to that number, and then divide by uh, nx. I think that will get, so, well, I can try, see, see if I, see if that's correct. So, so first I, I'll do this. So I'm, I'm going to attempt to get the coordinates for, uh, this is level and i. Okay, so ix will be a number between 0 and printf. I'll, I'll print the numbers so, so we can check as we go. It's always good to confirm, even if you think you know the answer. So I'm going to print i, the index of the cell, and then ix, two numbers. Okay, I'm going to print this thing here. Okay. Okay, it's printing numbers between 0 and 8. Ah, that's because it's level 3. So. Um, this example, step 10, is calculating this level here is at 3. So the number is between 0 and 7. And so once we get this two-dimensional number, um, 
to determine the center coordinate, we calculate from Ix let's have what's the Ix times I don't know plus 0 0.5 divided by Nx. Nx is Nx is this thing here. We know that Nx is the number of boxes in each direction. So in this case, it's 8. This will give me back uh, 2 to the level. And level is 3, so it will give me back 8. I will divide this by 8. And this should be the, the coordinate of the box. So if I, if I say that x is the coordinate of the box, x and y. So these are the two coordinates of the boxes. So I, I will try to print that along with the ix and ix0 and ix1. So let's, let's see if I am calculating this correctly. Before we move on, it's good to check that um, this is being calculated correctly. Step 10. 